Traffic can be both frustrating to experience and also challenging to study. Last week I was stuck in this traffic jam where we were alternating between being completely stopped and crawling along. But why? There were no accidents or any obvious cause, it was just a busy afternoon. So why this stop and go traffic pattern? In this video, we're going to explore how mathematical modeling can give us some insights into the problem of traffic. Before we get into the video, two quick notes. And the first is that this video is my submission to the Summer of Math Exposition 2. This contest is put on by 3Blue1Brown and Laos Labs, two excellent YouTubers. And if you check out this Sum2 hashtag, you'll find just so many really delightful videos. And I'll put a link down in the description. So definitely check out those. Secondly, while this video is ostensibly about traffic, my larger goal is to expose you to some of the flavors of mathematical modeling in general. So we're going to use a bit of a heuristic where we first define the problem to study. We're going to decide which variables are relevant to be considered. We're going to make assumptions that simplify our model. We're going to finally build the actual model and analyze it and assess it. This process isn't really linear. It's perhaps more cyclical as we iteratively improve on the model as we go along. This is a single lane road with a sequence of cars. We can imagine that we're flying on top of the road, looking down, and we're flying at the speed of traffic. So the cars don't look like they're moving, but the underground road is. Now imagine the far right car is going to start braking. What you experience is a perturbation of that brake as it travels down the line. Perturbation sometimes gets bigger and bigger as you go. The cars at the back start oscillating more and more. In fact, you can even have a crash. Now I want to decide, what should I actually put into my model? When I think about myself as a driver, the main thing that I can control when I'm on a single lane of traffic is my braking or my acceleration. And so what I'm going to try to do is come up with a bit of a mind map of the different factors that might influence whether I brake or accelerate. For example, one factor might be the following distance. If you find yourself right behind somebody in front of you, you might want to brake and stretch out that distance. In contrast, if the other car is far away from you, then you could accelerate a little bit and make up that gap. So certainly the following distance is going to influence whether I hit the brake or the gas pedal. What other factors might I consider? Well, one other might be the relative speed of the two cars. If the car in front of me is going much slower than I am, I'm going to have to slow down, otherwise I'm going to run into them. If they're driving much faster than I have, that following distance is going to increase and I could accelerate for a while. So there are two factors, but you can probably think about a whole bunch of other ones, whether it's upcoming obstacles, your emotional state, whether there's police on the road, whether you're being tailgated, what the conditions of the road are, and probably many others that I encourage you to pause and reflect on. If I try to deal with all of these factors, some of which are very human or sociological in nature, it's going to be extremely hard to capture all of that mathematically. And so I'm going to focus just on two the following distance and the relative speed. This is the only two inputs that I'm going to bring into my model, the two factors that I'm going to use to determine my braking or my acceleration. Now it might be that you care about something else. Maybe you're working in AI and being able to see far in the distance towards upcoming obstacles was actually really important to what you're studying. And so my model is missing something important. That's okay. A model isn't right or wrong, it's just useful in different ways depending on what it is that you're trying to study. Let's be a bit more granular with the assumptions implicit in what we're talking about. So I'm going to imagine my fake road again, and I've got a series of cars that every one of them has the same mass m. So my first assumption is that all cars are going to have the same mass m. This kind of assumption of homogeneity just simplifies my model, and we could relax this later perhaps if we want to, but for now it's just a reasonable first simplification to make. Similarly, I'm going to assume that all cars have the same length just to keep it simpler. I'm going to define precisely some variable names here, x1 of t, x2 of t, x3 of t, and so forth. These denote the location of the front of the ith vehicle at any moment in time t. And that I have written them with inequalities is a shorthand for multiple assumptions at once. 
I'm really assuming that they're all in one lane. Every car is in one lane, there's no passing, so the different cars are all stuck in the order in which they are. And then the final consideration with regards to the XIs is, let, let's just imagine I advance just a little bit. And the front two cars got bumper to bumper, so there was no distance between them. This is when a crash would occur. And after a crash has occurred, my model is just going to break down. I'm not trying to describe what's happened after a crash. I'm hopefully trying to prevent crashes. So my condition is that for any specific car, say the eighth one, that it needs to be more than one car length behind the car in front of it. In other words, Xi is less than Xi minus one plus L. This condition is saying no cars have crashed. Now that I know what my problem is, the types of things I'm going to consider, and some simplifying assumptions, I'm ready to write down what my actual model is. So I'm trying to describe a force, a braking force, which by Newton's law is mass times acceleration. And so I'm going to write it as the mass of the car times the second derivative of xi of t, xi referring to the location of the front of the i car. So what should this be equal to? Well, I know the factors I want to consider. I already told them to you. I want to consider following distance and relative velocity. So I want some equation that's going to respect these two different things. I'll note two things. First is the larger the relative velocity, the bigger that acceleration is going to be. And similarly, the smaller the following distance, the bigger the acceleration is going to be. And so what about this as a formula? On the top, I have the difference between the velocities, in other words, the relative velocity. So I'm saying my braking force is proportional to the relative velocities. And in the denominator, I've put the following distance, that difference between the positions of the two cars. And this is meaning that my braking force is inversely proportional to the following distance, which Makes sense with what I said. If the following distance is very small, you might have to brake very aggressively. Out the front, I have some constant of proportionality c because I don't know what that is going to be. Now, this equation is not the only equation you could write down. You might say, well, hold on, how do I know that it's proportional to relative velocity and not relative velocity squared, for example? Well, I don't. But this is a reasonable first guess. So let's play with it. Let's take this as our model. And we can analyze and assess later on whether we think this model is actually going to be good. And if you want to pause and reflect and think, is there a way you could improve on this initial equation, I would definitely encourage you to do so. There is one thing I really don't like about it though. And this is a core problem with driving, which is that because we're all human, we don't react instantly to what the person in front of us does. If someone in front of us just immediately starts braking, we don't start braking at the same instant in time. We break a little later than that. And so I'm going to take this x double prime of t and I'm going to add an extra factor. x double prime of t plus tau where tau is a response time. For example, maybe tau is one or two seconds. The person in front of you breaks, it takes a little bit of time for you to notice and for you to act on that until you break as well. That response time is tau. I had my list of assumptions we've talked about previously, so now I'm going to add one more to that list of assumptions. It's that the tau is the same for everybody. We'll just assume everybody has the same response time. Nevertheless, this is the equation that we get. Two things I want to change about this equation. First, I have two different constants, an m and a c. Let's just divide out by the m and rewrite this as c tilde, just to no longer have to deal with multiple constants. Second and more important change is I think I want to talk about velocities and I'm going to keep my analysis at the level of velocities as opposed to acceleration. This is how I'm going to simulate it, for example, later on. And so I'm just going to integrate once to go from accelerations to velocities. When I do an integration that's going to pick up a constant of integration, I write it d sub i because it could be different for every single car. But nevertheless, this is what I call my model and there it is. Nevertheless, this is the model that I'm going to work with, that vi of t plus tau is equal to a constant times the logarithm of the following distance plus some other constant di. This is a microscopic model, and what I mean by that is it's focused in on one car. What does the one car look towards? It looks to the car in front of it, and it obeys the rules of the model. But I can talk about some macroscopic properties. 
For example, consider these two roadways. I've got two different streams of cars. All the cars on the top have the same spacing between them and they're all going at the same speed. And likewise for the cars on the bottom, a different following distance, a different speed, but it's all the same for all the cars on the bottom. This is what I'm going to refer to as an equilibrium. For equilibrium, all cars have to be the same velocity. And second, I'm not going to allow a scenario like this one where they have different distances between them. I'm going to insist that they all have the same distance between them, and I'm going to call that distance d. When my cars are at equilibrium, I can speak to notions like density. Density is defined to be the number of cars in some unit distance. For example, in this scenario, I see four different cars, and this is over four times L plus D, the four cancel, and the density for this portion of road is one over L plus D. Or if I prefer using my XI notation, I could notice that L plus D is just the same thing as the distance between XI and XI minus one. And so the density is, well, either of these two expressions, and we're actually gonna use both as we go along in the video. If I send all the cars together like this, so the D goes to zero, then I get a maximum density. This density would be the place where there's no ability to drive, your velocity is gonna be right down to zero because there's not even a centimeter of gap between the cars. But nevertheless, the density would just be four cars over four L in distance, so one divided by L. My notation for this is rho sub max for, for the maximum density. So a question I could have is, how is the velocity of the cars at equilibrium related to the density? If there's way more cars on the road, I'm probably gonna start driving slower to avoid collisions, but how much slower exactly? For instance, I might say that there's a maximum velocity that when there's very few cars on the road, I'm just gonna drive the speed limit or maybe 10 over the speed limit if we're being honest. But we can assume that there's a maximum velocity where it doesn't really matter whether there's no other cars or just a couple other cars, we're gonna go with that constant velocity. But then we hit a critical velocity, which is that there is enough traffic on the road that we're gonna start slowing down. And I don't know exactly how this looks. Maybe something like this. I just hand drew this a little bit earlier. Something that's declining, the more cars there are on the road, the higher their density, the lower my velocity until finally I get to that maximum density where my velocity is dropped off to zero and the cars are just bumper to bumper. So one use of the model that we came up earlier would be to figure out what is that curve exactly? Let's see if we can do that. We had our model as quoted earlier, this VI of T plus tau is all of that stuff. But we're talking about at equilibrium now. So let's see what the equilibrium assumptions are gonna do. The first thing I can do then is take the xi minus the xi minus one and replace that with one over the density. We had seen that at equilibrium density was one over that following distance. Now when I look at this expression, I notice that there's an i still appearing in two different places. The ith car is gonna be this logarithm thing plus an ith constant. But if you're at equilibrium, the velocity is the same for every single car. So let's just actually get rid of the eyes completely on the left, which is gonna force it to be gone on the right as well. So I've got two constants, a C and a D. Thankfully, I have some hope because in my graph, I had two points that I knew. I had this critical density, this maximum density, two different points, two different constants. I have a hope for being able to solve these. So let's just plug this in first. I'll evaluate at the maximum density. This is where my velocity is zero. If I choose to isolate for D, I get an expression. I'll substitute my expression in. I have the difference of two logarithms, which is the logarithm of a quotient. And with a little bit of algebra, we get C times the logarithm of rho max divided by rho. So I've figured out the D. Now I need to figure out the C, but I have another point that I can evaluate. I can evaluate this at the critical density, the density where you first start going slower. I know that at the critical density, I'm going at the speed V maximum. That was its intention. And so I can solve for the value of C, I can plug this into my formula and I get this. It's a bit messy, but actually it's not so bad because most of the stuff up the front, that's all just one big constant. And I've given it a special name. I've called these exogenous parameters. And exogenous parameters is the buzzword for 
values of constants that come to us from outside the model. I'm not trying to figure out the maximum velocity. That depends on the city in which you might be driving. I'm not trying to tell you what the maximum density is. That was one over the length of the car. Well, maybe different places have different sort of average lengths of cars. And since we're making the simplifying assumption that all cars are going to be the same length here, that could change place to place. And then likewise for that critical density, that density where it's finally enough cars in the road where you start going a little bit slower. Well, that depends on the driving habits of the place you're at. And that could totally be different in different cities. I'm sure you've been to places that drive more aggressively and places that drive less aggressively. So the values of all of those constants depend on your real world situation. And those are going to be coming to our model. But ultimately, it's going to be a number out the front. And really, when you think about the only place where a row is, it's inside of the one logarithm. Logarithm of row max over row. That's where our variable is. All right, so back to our graph. Recall, we're trying to figure out what exactly should this weird curve look like? Well, if you plotted the equation I just gave you, you instead get this. It was a logarithmic decay. And so now, according to the model, this is the kind of behavior that you should get. Now, this relationship between velocity and density is interesting, and I like it. But actually, density is not the most important factor to consider. Let's go back to this particular graphic with two streams of traffic at two different equilibriums. Pay attention to the far right-hand side of the screen and notice that the cars drift off at the exact same time. That's because I programmed it that one is traveling twice as fast with half the density, and so it just works out exactly the same. But the lesson here is that faster isn't necessarily better. If, for example, you're some civil engineer and in your road system there's a major choke point, maybe getting across the big bridge outside of the city at rush hour, something like that, you might instead be interested in maximizing the number of cars that you can get crossing that choke point in some interval of time. You might be interested in the flux. The flux is the number of cars that are going to pass a point in some unit of time. Flux and density are related. For example, you could say that flux is therefore the number of cars in some unit distance, some unit distance in term over time. Distance over time is just, well, velocity and number of cars over distance. That was our notion of density. So the flux here is just going to be, well, density times the velocity, which itself is a function of density. We've computed the formula for v of rho already. It was this gnarly expression. So I just multiply by one more rho, and it sticks out the front. And again, messy, but really rho appears in two different places out the front and in the denominator inside of the one logarithm. It could be that a stream of cars which is traveling slower because it's denser actually empties that downtown faster, that more cars are going to be leaving it because of this particular property. So I can actually compute what the maximum flux is. I mean, how do I figure out maximums in the first year calculus sense? Well, I could just take the derivative of the flux and set it equal to zero. That was a little bit of a messy expression, so I will leave it to you to do down in the comments. But trust me, the maximum occurs at rho max divided out by e, which I'm going to denote to be the optimal density, rho sub opt. So what does this look like? I have my density plot that we've seen earlier. I'm going to put on the right vertical flux, and then the flux looks something like this. In the initial portion up to rho crit, where velocity is constant, and so our flux is just that constant times rho, it's linear. And then afterwards, you have this maximum at the optimal density, and it decreases from there. You might think, how do you know the optimal density is to the right of the critical density? Well, remember how we said the optimal density was rho max divided by e? And, and rho max was just 1 over the length of a car. So this optimal density is when you're traveling actually with less than two car lengths behind the car in front of you, which is a density that I think for most of us we wouldn't be comfortable driving at a sort of maximum speed at. So probably this optimal density is to the right of the critical density, which is when you start slowing down from your maximum velocity. So our model is now giving some real insight at some of these macroscopic issues of density and of flux and what the optimal density to have the maximum flux is. We're learning a lot based on this relatively simplistic model, if it matches real world scenarios.
One other little just nice simplifying piece of algebra I'm going to do for you just to help us later on, which is that at the equilibrium and optimal densities, recall this formula we had before for what the V as a function of the density was. Previously we'd solved for C in terms of three different exogenous parameters, but if I just plug in the optimal density here, which as I mentioned was computed to be rho max divided by E, the rho max is cancel, logarithm of E is just one, and so what do I get? that the C is nothing but the optimal velocity. The velocity is gonna occur when people are driving the optimal density. So we get this nice simplification when we're traveling at equilibrium at the optimal density. Let's return now to this example where we saw an initial car braking and the effect of that braking perturbating down the line of cars. So we're gonna utilize what we've just seen to try to understand this larger sequence. One of the reasons I love doing computations at equilibriums is because equilibriums simplify my model tremendously and figuring out the perturbation from the equilibrium is typically easier than just something where you're really far away from an equilibrium. And so frustratingly, perhaps, I'm gonna to try to transition variables. I'm gonna begin with the x1, which I'm gonna stay at time zero is gonna start at zero. So that's where my zero point is. I also have an x2 at time zero. I'm then going to imagine they go forward at equilibrium. So they're going just at a constant velocity. This means for the first car that's been traveling for time t at a velocity v, its location is v times t. Remember the length of the cars was l, the gap between them was d, so the next car back is the same location vt, but one displacement back, and so I get vt minus l plus d. That's what happens if it's equilibrium. But what if I perturb it from equilibrium? What if I move it just a little bit so the cars are not quite at their equilibrium locations? I can have my old labels for these, the x1 of t and the x2 of t, and what I really have is two little displacements. This is how much they differ from what they ought to have been if they had been going at equilibrium. It's this displacement which I will denote z1 of t and z2 of t that captures that perturbation. Okay, so my official definition of zi of t for the ith perturbation is just xi of t, but then I subtract off where it would have been at equilibrium, which is vt minus however many d plus l's I have, i minus one in this case. And I can take derivatives of this pretty easily. For example, one derivative is just gonna be, well, derivative of xi gives me vi, derivative of minus vt is minus v, and there is no t's in the rest of it, so this is all I have. And likewise, I could shift this from t to t plus tau, that would be fine as well. So this is my change of variables between the xi's, vi's, and so forth, and the zi's me measuring this, this perturbation from equilibrium. In this expression, we know a lot from the vi's. We had our model, and that was the whole point. This was our big model for the vi's. And previously, we figured out what those constants are gonna be at equilibrium, at the optimal density, the C was gonna be the V and the D was this minus C logarithm of one over rho max. So I'm gonna plug both of those in. I'm gonna combine my two logarithms into one single logarithm and I get this expression here. And I'm almost happy to take where I'm at and plug it into my top line for the ZI prime, except I want everything to be in terms of Zs and this expression here is in terms of Xs. And then remembering how we define these terms, at equilibrium, the gaps between two successive values of x was always gonna be d plus l. And so when I transfer from what the actual values of x down to just this perturbation, the z's, I have to add in this d plus l. So I've got this extra factor d plus l plus the difference between the perturbations. Now, this is great. This describes all the cars to which they're following behind some other car. But what about the first car on the line? What about the very first one that's gonna cause the initial problem by doing the initial braking? So I need to create a completely separate, quick little model just for that first car to describe how it behaves, and then all the cars behind it are gonna follow according to the equation I just showed you. So first car, a very simple little model we can come up with. All I care about is it's starting at the equilibrium velocity. It breaks for a little bit, maybe from zero to some other time like T1, and then it just accelerates back up to the equilibrium velocity. I'm imagining that a ball rolls across the road, one person breaks aggressively, what is the perturbation that happens behind them? Just sort of modeling that quick little break. 
So I just need to come up with some function to describe this velocity that respects that. For the purpose of what we're studying, if you have some other braking function you prefer, that's great, power to you. This is just the one I'm using. It's a constant velocity when it's less than zero, and then at zero it goes by v times this weird multiplicative thing, and the multiplicative thing has a t in two places. First t equal to zero, it has no effect, that's gonna make it continuous. And then likewise, at t equal to t1, this is one of my exponential turns, negative, and so I'm gonna have a quick exponential decay after that. And so it's gonna satisfy the type of thing I was trying to model. In fact, if you wanna plot a graph of it, it just looks like this. This is going at the equilibrium reading velocity up to time zero, it dips down until time t1, and then it increases back again. If I wanna go from x primes down to z's, two different things are changing. First, I have to do one integration to get from the primes to the displacements. So I integrate this expression on the right-hand side, the t's turn into s's for the dummy variable, and then I have to subtract off of vt because I'm going to displacement. This is my displacement. Whatever you think of this first car, and as I say, you can totally change it, it really doesn't make any difference to me, I now am ready to state my entire model. So here it is. This is called a differential delay system. It's a system of equations, one for each of my cars. I have initial conditions, which is that the initial displacement for every one of the n different cars that I have is zero at time zero. The behavior of the first car is described by some function, such as the one that I chose. And then for all subsequent cars, from i going from two down to n, they are described by this differential delay equation. An equation that computes the derivative not at time t, but time t plus tau and it relates that to the values of the displacement of that car and the car in front of it at time t. If it didn't have that delay factor, that plus tau, this would be a system of differential equations as you'd see in any number of different differential equation courses. I'm gonna show you at the end of the video a little bit about how to solve differential delay equations. They're actually kind of cool, but I wanna to get to the analysis. I've taken that model, I've programmed it into MATLAB, and that's how I managed to create this particular animation here, where the first car starts braking, and it perturbates that wave down. But you'll notice specifically that the cars at the end, they're doing a little bit of an oscillation. I can actually see this a little bit clearer with a different type of graph. This is the graph of displacement as a function of time. And what you can notice is that as time goes on, the first car, the Z1 in orange, it dips down a little bit because of that braking. But look at what happens to the dips as you go down the chain of cars. Look, for example, at that blue Z8 at the bottom. This is a dip that is larger than the initial dips were gonna be, and then starts doing some oscillations. And so this gives us an important lesson. According to this model, an initial displacement caused by a short braking when it perturbs down the line, actually gets more and more aggressive. Delayed, but more aggressive. And then it leads to the kind of stop and go behavior we've seen before where your velocity is going faster and then slower and then faster and slower. What's really crucial is what that tau was, that reaction time, that delay factor. Let me plot you a different version. This is the same model, I've just chosen a larger value for tau. And you'll notice that these lines start crossing over each other, which is equivalent to a crash happening. This is when the distance between the cars gets more than the value of d. A crash has actually occurred. That's what's indicated by these lines overlapping. So when you just increase the reaction time, crashes become more likely because you get more aggressive perturbations later on. This is why so many of the good driving habits you've learned before, like not drinking or not being on your phones, these are so important because they affect the crucial issue of reaction time. And that's pretty much exactly why crashes happen. If we could all have no reaction time, like maybe we're a series of AI driven cars all going along on the road, maybe we could have tiny, tiny, tiny following distances and drive really, really, really quickly because we could respond so accurately. But for us humans, that reaction time is what causes crashes. So what do I think about this model? What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? Is it a good model at the end of the day? Well, there's a few things to say in the positive camp, which is first that it does predict phenomena that we expect. 
When I was looking at the inputs to the model, I was just thinking about one car microscopically. What is it looking at in terms of the car in front of it? But what I got out of this model was these effects like that a perturbation would grow as time goes on. You'd get oscillation behaviors occurring when you're in that stop and go traffic. We see that in the real world. We didn't bake it into the model, but it came out. So this does have a strength. It predicts a phenomena that we expect to see. Similarly, I like this model because it did inform us about some things. According to the model, it informed us things like that optimal density to maximize the flux. The model doesn't sit there, it lets us know things according to the model. I could explain it, hopefully relatively simply to all of you, and I could put it into my software and compute it. It was a doable model if I had a couple different values of those exogenous parameters, like the maximum velocity. And then finally, I like that those inputs into the model, like the, the maximum velocity or the critical density, that these are things that you could go out in the real world and observe them. Doesn't sound like it would be outrageous to actually get real world data to be able to compute any of these out. But it's not all good. I mean, some weaknesses were that the assumptions were really limited, like, I was only looking one car in front of you. I mean, come on, most people look more than one car in front of them. They can predict the problem spots far in advance. That's a big limitation for sure. And you can think of many other assumptions that just weren't considered under this model. There's a lot of homogeneity assumptions, for example, where in reality, it might just be one person who has a really bad reaction time. Perhaps they've been drinking or something like this. Also, we've seen that the behavior gets non-physical. For example, since those perturbations were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the model basically predicts that a crash is always going to happen, so at some point, the model is going to break down. It's not perfect. But then, no model ever is, because a model isn't right or wrong. Our model is just possibly useful. The final thing I really want to do is just share a little bit about how to solve a system of differential delay equations. They're just really cool. So what I really want to do is come up with a bit of a matrix, where on the columns I have different time intervals. Minus tau to zero, zero to tau, tau to two tau, and so on. And then on the rows, I have the different cars and their displacements. So for example, when time was negative, we're just saying there's no displacement for all of them. And then for the first car, we're saying it's given by just some function, could be the one I chose. Then according to the way this differential delay equation works, if I want to compute out, say, this cell, this is going to be governed by z2 prime of t plus tau, but in the equation, the z1 and z2 that are going to be relevant are both at time t. So the two pieces of information are the z1 in that negative interval and the z2 in that negative interval, both of which are zero. And just a quick reminder, the d plus l was e over rho max, and so the rho max is canceled, the z's are going to cancel, we're just going to have logarithm of e, which is one, the v's are going to cancel, and you'll have a derivative of zero, which, since it starts at a displacement of zero, it will end up as zero, just doing a quick bit of mental math. But the next one's not that easy, because now the z1 of t is some non-trivial function, and I get an actual differential equation, and you can analytically solve that up to your ability to solve integrals, and of course integrals can get very hard analytically, but you can do them numerically. Likewise for the next time interval, you're looking back a time interval at your car and the car in front of you previously. We can go down all the way through this grid trying to figure out what's going to happen for each of these cells, and all the way along it's going to give us this procedure to compute out the entire table. My entire simulation was just doing Euler's method, which is a numerical simulation on solving first order differential equations. It was doing exactly this. All right, that gets us to the end of the video. Two quick thank yous. The first is to a former professor of mine, Reinhard Illner, and his lovely book, Mathematical Modeling. This video is heavily inspired by one of the case studies that he introduced in this book. And then secondly, thank you to 3Blue1Brown and Laos Labs for sponsoring the Summer of Math Exposition 2. I've had a ton of fun and I know there are a lot of other videos for you to go and check out next, so definitely would encourage you to do that. If you have any thoughts or questions about this video, please leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.